OK, so the, um, the cider, I have some slides, but I'll, I'll do mostly talking. Talking. The, um, the goals, the side was started with the realization that there are many disciplines that uh, contribute to uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, what's, uh, what's the interior of the Earth, uh, how the interior of the Earth works, and in particular, you know, why we have plate tectonics. Uh, and many disciplines co um, uh, contribute to it, but each of them only has uh, um, a, a knowledge of one part of the problem. And um, we have evolved into a system where the disciplines become quite narrow and uh, don't really know very well, uh, don't understand deeply about each other. So the idea here is to try and, and remedy this by providing a cross-education among the disciplines in various ways. And so, uh, you know, the main goal of CIDR, as, as is indicated here, is to tackle the fundamental question on the nature of global dynamic processes that drive plate tectonics on Earth. And it, um, uh, again, it's, uh, it's based on the realization that all these different disciplines, which I won't go into details, you, can, uh, you know, of course, which they are, co contribute to the understanding of the Earth interior structure and evolution. And all of this is grounded on uh, observations at the Earth's surface and from remote sensing. I mean, we, we are the, uh, by essence, an inverse problem, right? The Earth is opaque. So um, basically, we wanted to um, create a framework for uh, the, a multidisciplinary research in the geosciences and uh, also um, as a complement to the infrastructure, that ha there has been a lot of effort to build infrastructure in geosciences in the last uh, decades in all of the different disciplines, and also uh, the aspect of educational uh, across disciplinary environment for the young generation, but it turns out that it's also very useful for the old generation. So we started with uh, some community workshops. There was one in May 2003 and another one in May 2009. Some, some of you have participated in these to, um, to, to try to, to uh, define the program and uh, seek funding. And the first thing that was funded were those summer programs. And um, as, as uh, was mentioned already, we, the first one was 2004, so this is the 10th anniversary. We need to celebrate somehow. And we've, um, initially, the program was funded by NSF CSEDI. The first one was actually co-funded by CSEDI and KITP. KITP um, provided the infrastructure um, and um, uh, the CSEDI program funded the, the travel um, expenses of the, of the participants. Uh, the, um, and in the following uh, years, we, we did every two years a program on the deep earth. And you can see here the different topics that have been, um, uh, you know, the themes of the different programs. And then starting in um, 2012, we, uh, we obtained a grant from the FESDI program, the Frontiers in Earth Systems Dynamics, for uh, a synthesis center, which allowed us to not only uh, continue the summer programs, but also expand, uh, expand the CIDR program. So the first expansion, which actually was already started 2011 before FESD, was to um, move to a yearly summer program where uh, we alternate between topics related to deep, really deep processes and more uh, you know, near surface processes. And so we started with one 2011 on dynamics of mountain building and 2013 from mantle to crust, continental formation and destruction. And we're starting to plan the one for next summer, which is going to be on tectonics and climate. And these alternate years programs are held at UC Berkeley, while the ones on the deep earth have been held here at KITP with, of course, the wonderful infrastructure that is provided here by KITP. So the summer program structure, um, we usually have uh, one or two weeks of informal KITP style program. This is what's been going on in the past two weeks. And then four weeks of more uh, structured tutorial workshop program. Um, and I already said about the deep versus shallow. 
And since uh, 2012, we also have been holding a workshop um, associated with AGU. So it's been a post-AGU workshop on the Saturday following AGU, where what we do is we, um, we invite uh, talks that uh, sort of summarize what was done in the summer program before, and also uh, talks that kind of kick off the summer program of the following year. So, and we're going to have one uh, this fall. Uh, there's going to be some discussion as when it's going to be because AGU is very late this year, but we'll, you'll hear more about it um, uh, later during the program. And in particular, we, um, you know, we invite students that have been working on projects that were started during, uh, during uh, CIDR uh, in previous years and that have continued to work on these projects to, to present the um, advancement or, or the results of their projects. We, um, so we so we support research projects that, uh, as you will see, some of you may not be very clear on how this happens, but over the next two weeks, we will start um, kind of uh, f um, thinking about themes, multidisciplinary themes that can form groups, research groups that will uh, then work during the following two weeks to, um, you know, to advance some, some uh, fundamental question uh, that, uh, that needs input from different disciplines. And some of these groups um, are you know, enthusiastic enough that they want to continue, and we can provide some support for this, uh, for, for uh, continuing for the following year off-site. And some actually uh, continue for, for several years and, uh, and develop new collaborations this, fas this fashion. Uh, we also support so-called working groups. This is different. These are uh, groups of scientists that ne don't necessarily all have participated in the summer program, but that would like to get together to, to think together about some multidisciplinary question. And so an example, so far we've had one working group uh, on the construction of the three reference earth model, so a seismological reference earth model that would be useful for mineral physicists, for geodynamicists, etc. And this, actually, I should say, this working group led to a funded proposal. And uh, Vedlekitz here is the PI on, on that proposal and starting to work on uh, the reference earth model. Uh, we had another one on the question of attenuation in the earth which brought together seismologists and mineral physicists and some geodynamicists, I think. And then um, just earlier this week, there was a, a group uh, discussing uh, geoneutrinos, geo which I think was, from what I hear, was quite uh, successful. And, and we have a couple others uh, that are in the work, one on geomagnetic prediction and another one on dynamic topography. So just to give you an idea of CIDA summer program products, so the research groups I've already mentioned, they form during the summer program, and some of them, not all, but, uh, but quite a few, continue to function after the end of the summer program. They present um, AGU uh, posters. In fact, now AGU deadline is uh, very early. Um, so the AGU deadline actually is going to be just at the end of this, uh, of this program. So um, it's, you know, it's going to be maybe a good, good timing for, for uh, deciding on, on, um, on sending a, a, an abstract. Uh, there has been, of course, uh, that led to publications. And more generally, you know, collaborations have been formed that led to proposals or, or publications. We're trying to keep track of this. Uh, and, uh, you know, last but not least, the networking among participants is very important. Um, among, it's basically, uh, you know, um, the, um, uh, your peers, you, learn, you kind of get to meet your peers and you get to meet also more senior faculty in the field and that uh, leads to important uh, links in the future and uh, also uh, perhaps helps people get postdoc and faculty positions. We have a good track record on this. Uh, this is just an example for you to think about uh, from, I took this from, because I had the slide ready, from CIDR 2010, the research groups, you know, the kind of topics that they um, looked at, and you can, you can read this, I won't, I won't go, you can find all this information on the CIDR wiki, by the way, so, um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, just uh, governance, I think I should uh, uh, recognize uh, the input of uh, many colleagues. Uh, the initial, this, this was the starting uh, uh, kind of governance with the starting uh, steering committee. 
uh, which was um, uh, <laughs> chaired by Adam Jeronski, who just walked in the room. <laughs> And then uh, we had another one chaired by Louis Kellogg following. And now since uh, the FESD uh, um, funding, we uh, have a more formal governance with an executive committee, an advisory committee, and of course, I'm, I'm the PI. So, but I should say it's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> this is just an example of past programs. And this brings, I put this here so I remember to tell you that we will have a group photo. We'll have to organize this probably on Thursday morning or some during the break, but we'll see. OK, so that's all I have to say, an introduction, general introduction to CIDR. If you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll um, let Bruce, who is the uh, main organizer of this workshop, of this uh, program, um, introduce, get us warmed up on the. Before we start the, the science. Yes. Oh, yes, actually, thanks for reminding me because I wanted to say that this year we have three, yes. at least three, I hope I'm not forgetting, at least three lecturers who have been students of CIDR in, in the early years. And maybe the, well, the, stand up. There's Anat Shahar and Ved Lekitz and um, Jessica Irving. And there is going to be also Mark Panning. And I should say that Max Rudolph was a student also, and he's a senior participant. Uh, uh, yes, and finally, but maybe you'll mention that, that there will be room for research talks, right, yes, by yes. senior participants that are not lecturers, preferably. And so if you want to volunteer, uh, maybe you can tell them that. Okay. Here. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I wanted to just make a few uh, introductory remarks, further introductory remarks about the program. Uh, the title of this program, the theme of this program is Dynamics of Planetary Interiors. And many of the elements that we've had at, at past ciders are going to continue with this uh, program. We're going to have uh, lectures and discussions of areas in geochemistry and mineral physics, seismology and geodynamics. Uh, the particular focus, though, I guess this year is going to be trying to take a slightly broader uh, planetary perspective of, of dynamics of terrestrial bodies and that sort of thing. So uh, when we talk about internal dynamics, though, necessarily we're going to be slightly restricted and we're going to be using our insights and knowledge from Earth as a guide, but we need to be aware of how dramatically different uh, some of the other planets are likely to be, different beyond our ability to imagine. And so we'll always uh, need to keep stock of that fact. Um, I guess the, the motive, though, I suppose, is really to have a better understanding of how Earth fits into the larger scheme, both in our own solar system and potentially beyond. I want to sort of acknowledge and uh, point, call out, actually, the people that have contributed to this uh, program. I'm just one of the organizers. Uh, Bill McDonough has been looking after the geochemistry. <laughs> Quentin Williams has been looking after the mineral physics, right there. Uh, Barbara, of course, has been in charge of the, the seismology, and I've looked after the geodynamics. And so I guess the main point that I want to make is that I want to sort of turn this meeting over to you. This is really our meeting, and we're hoping you will take ownership and participate. We have scheduled one and a half hour lectures in the morning, but we're really asking the lecturers to only spend an hour at most. Uh, talking, and then we'll leave the rest of the time open for discussion and interaction. And as Barbara mentioned, we have had a habit in the past of having senior participants or anyone really who's interested in presenting some uh, informal discussion of their research work in the afternoon. And again, if you are interested in doing that, just let me know and we can get you fit into the schedule. Okay, so that's, that's the 
the overarching goal. Um, Barbara asked uh, Bill and I if we would actually give some introductory remarks. And uh, so we organized carefully together and, and came up with quite different strategies in terms of how to go about doing this. What I wanted to do uh, was talk just a little bit, give you a roadmap, I think, of where we're going, just in case the, the, the path is not clear once we set out on it. This is sort of the intent. So if we think about, uh, yep, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So in, in that sense, so in some ways it's appropriate that we have the World Cup on, right? So that as we go through, there could be like stoppage time, right? Where you sort of say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't come out of my time, right? Um, but I think that's right. I think that what really makes this successful is the fact that there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of different points of view. Uh, you shouldn't hesitate. And this is, I guess, what I meant by ownership. You shouldn't hesitate to participate in the discussion. Um, and if the senior participants have to illustrate early on that there are foolish questions that we can ask of our colleagues in other fields, we'll try to do our best to show you that that's the case. Okay? So, okay. So, Geological activity. I guess what we're really thinking about here is uh, ge geologically active planets, and these are expressed in a variety of ways. You think of it in terms of volcanism or a particular style of, of tectonics. And this is an example. This is Io, a moon of Jupiter, which is thought to be or often described as the most dynamically or geologically active planet in the solar system. But what all of these, uh, all elements of this problem are ultimately related to convection, the idea that you're bringing heat from the interior to the surface, driving these flows. And so all of the geological processes are fundamentally driven by convection. So certainly in terms of the uh, geodynamics component to the program, there's going to be a very heavy emphasis on convection in a variety of different settings. And we understand this process pretty well. Uh, this is a figure that I took from the USGS, so that's the official view of mantle convection, I think, is a, a pot of water or a beaker of water uh, with a Bunsen burner underneath. And so the water gets warmed up, it expands, becomes uh, buoyant and rises. And at the same time, the fluid at the top cools and sinks down, and you get this overturning circulation. And you're going to see, again, from a lot of the geodynamics uh, presentations, there are, there are numbers or combinations of parameters that you can use to describe this process. And so one you'll be hearing a lot is the Rayleigh number, and it involves a, a bunch of parameters of the fluid, the, say the viscosity or the uh, thermal diffusivity, the coefficient of expansion, the temperature difference across the layer or the thickness. And the great thing about this number is it sort of characterizes the vigor of convection. And the standard, what I would call the standard model of convection, if I'm permitted, uh, makes a number of very specific predictions about what we would expect to happen. So if you know the Rayleigh number, you can make predictions about what the heat flow ought to be in that system. It varies as the Rayleigh number to the one-third. And so, you know, if I make the temperature difference between the top and the bottom bigger, I make the Rayleigh number bigger, I expect the heat flow out of the system to be bigger. I can make predictions about the uh, amplitude of the velocities that I expect and make very specific predictions. Uh, the expectation is that the horizontal scale would be independent of Rayleigh number, roughly comparable to the, to the depth. And in fact, in the geodynamics tutorials uh, later this week, you guys will be running numerical models that look a little bit like this one, the fluids that are heated from the bottom and cooled from the top. You see these plumes rising up, the cold things sinking down, and you're going to test the what we would call predictions of the standard model to see, in fact, that that holds up. And this is a useful starting point. Of course, planets are going to be very different, and there is a number of complications that are going to arise. And I would say most of the lectures uh, dealing with this topic are going to be covering the complications that are relevant for planets. So this is a list of things. There are probably others that you could imagine. Rheology, which is the relationship between stress and strain, is a big one. Uh, it's, it's potentially very, very complicated. Uh, melting alters the composition, changes the volatile abundance in the Earth. It's also going to be pretty important. Geometry is one that's probably more specific to Earth, but the fact that you have plate tectonics introduces interesting geometric constraints that you wouldn't expect of a fluid that was just simply convecting, like a molasses or corn syrup or whatever experiments you do on the weekend in your kitchen, that kind of thing. Uh, rotation is huge, uh, plays a role in, in a variety of ways, and also turbulence I'll get to at the very, very end. So in terms of rheology, we normally think of very simple fluids as having a linear relationship between the applied stress, I guess we have a pointer, the applied stress, 
right here, and then the resulting strain. And this, this material property is just the viscosity. And in most fluids, water, for example, or uh, all those other fluids I mentioned, the, it's probably a pretty reasonable approximation. But in fact, when you're thinking about flows or creep in rocks that are deforming by a variety of different deformation mechanisms, the relationship between the stress that you apply and the deformation that you see can depend on a lot of different things. It's definitely going to be strongly dependent on temperature. It's potentially dependent on pressure. It can even depend on the stress, for example, and which gives rise to power law dependencies, which we'll, we'll be seeing more about. Uh, grain sizes, volatiles, partial melt, and even in the deformational history can play a huge, huge role. So this is just an example uh, from a paper uh, of my et al. from 2010, just taking laboratory experiments and putting them together to ask the question, uh, what is the strength of the lithosphere? And so what we're looking at here is the amount of stress that's required at, at different depths or different temperatures uh, to produce a strain rate of roughly on the order of 10 to the minus 14 per second. And it's a composite model that includes a variety of different mechanisms that apply in different parts of the lithosphere. Uh, brittle failure in the top, some form of low plasticity, low temperature plasticity at these low temperatures, and then a high temperature creep at much higher temperatures. And the point is that these stresses are really large. I mean, they're very, very large. And so if you were a sort of naive perspective about how you'd expect the Earth to behave, what you might think is that that lithosphere is just too strong to be deformed. And you would develop a type of convection which is known as stagnant lid convection, which is probably appropriate for the convection that takes place on Venus. But you get a very tough layer, it's very strong, you confine the convection to the underlying regions, uh, and it's very, very different structure and style than what we see with plate tectonics. In plate tectonics, somehow, the Earth has been able to sort of break these boundaries, produce weaknesses, and actually subduct the entire stagnant lid, which is actually very, very efficient. I mean, being able to take that cold lithosphere and stick it down into the interior makes plate tectonics particularly efficient in cooling the planet. And I would make the claim that this is actually essential, for example, for powering a magnetic field. The question of how you actually do this, how you break these boundaries, how you initiate subduction is sort of a long topic. The, the meeting uh, last year in Berkeley spent a lot of time talking about when plate tectonics might have began. Uh, a related and, and relevant issue is that even in the present day Earth, we have to nucleate and start new subduction zones periodically. And the first quantitative treatment, I think, of this problem was a paper by Dan McKenzie in a very obscure AGU monograph that people have found, fortunately. And he was just sort of looking at the question of what do I need to go from this state where I've got, say, an oceanic lithosphere next to a continental fragment and actually initiate some subduction zone. And what he pointed out was that you need to uh, introduce a certain amount of uh, convergence before this process takes off. So you have maybe some forces, ridge push, for example, that is uh, forcing convergence in this region. It's going to be resisted by fault frictions and bending and other sorts of things. And it's not until you've actually compressed or converged this plate enough that you've built enough of a subducting slab that this process will actually become self-sustaining. And so the way he described this was a finite amplitude instability. You need a finite amount of compression or convergence uh, before it would actually take off. And so in context, you could imagine that this very old oceanic lithosphere that's off the east coast of the United States, probably some of the oldest lithosphere out there, is probably not intrinsically unstable. It's probably perfectly happy just sitting there forever, unless, of course, there's some sort of convergence that will allow this to basically produce the finite instability that you need to have the process take off. Okay. It's actually funny, there have been a number of numerical models, to me anyways, it's funny, there have been a number of numerical models in the past that have sort of looked at this problem, um, and they get numbers which differ from this by about 10%. So Mackenzie got it right the first time in 77, with looks like just paper and pencil. So there's some value in, in that. Another complication that you're going to hear a lot about is melting. Melting changes the composition of the planet, it redistributes volatiles, and the remarkable thing about melting, in particular at a mid-ocean ridge environment like this, where you have some material at depth which has some temperature, you're bringing it up, rises along an adiabat, and crosses, so again, temperature versus, versus depth, and what I'm showing you here is the solidus and then the liquidus, so where melting begins and then where the, the solid becomes completely molten. And if you're hotter, you start melting a little bit deeper, uh, and then you evolve through this producing slightly more and more melt as you go, uh, but the point, I guess, is that the melt that's produced rises to the top, produces uh, basaltic crust, 
you get a depleted layer. And the remarkable thing, to me at least, when I first saw this, was that the products that are produced by this, their densities, are different from what you started with. And so this is a source of buoyancy which is going to play a huge role in the way in which convection operates. Um, there have been a number of studies, in particular this one by Van Heunen, that looked at this question about initiating subduction and the role that this chemical buoyancy actually plays. So here's our present day environment, sort of 1300 or a little over 1300. We have a melt layer, a crust, which is about 7 kilometers, and a depleted layer, which is about 45 slightly hotter, you melt a little bit deeper, and the thicknesses of these regions get larger and larger and larger. And what he's showing here really is the amount of cooling, how much cooling of that lithospheric plate do you need to make before you compensate for the intrinsical chemical buoyancy that's associated with the melting products. And the point is, as you go back in time and you have hotter and hotter temperatures, the amount of time that it takes to cool that lithosphere to being neutrally buoyant, not even dense, but neutrally buoyant, gets longer and longer and longer. And so Norm Sleep has looked at these ideas. This is a plot of potential temperature as a function of heat flux. And the point is that you see as we go back in time when the temperature is hotter, you do get more heat flux. That's the standard model. But in this particular case, the compositional effects of the lithosphere actually can turn this thing over. And so these are sort of the complications that are at the forefront of the research questions that we'll be looking at over the course of this next couple of weeks. Uh, Michael is going to talk a little bit about mixing. So we're producing chemical heterogeneity at the ridges. We're hydrating these, adding water into the minerals of these things. We're then subducting that material back into the interior. Uh, how does that chemical heterogeneity get mixed? How does the water, let's say, if we're actually adding water to the mantle, get homogenized back into the mantle? At what point or how long does it take before the water that we're introducing back into the mantle actually has a detectable influence on the rheology and feeds back in that way? And the answer is we don't know. Okay, geometry. This is sort of an odd thing, perhaps, but you know, when you require plate motions to be rigid at the surface, um, there are geometrical constraints on those flows. And anywhere where you have a ridge intersecting a subduction zone means that you're subducting stuff with virtually zero age. And so this is kind of a remarkable thing, you know, because we think of subduction or convection as being dense stuff sinking. But there's no question in this environment, we're actually taking stuff down that's probably buoyant just because it's connected and it's a geometric consequence of plate tectonics. Okay. So to rotation, I guess uh, for those of you, uh, this is a turntable, okay? And in the last century, people used these to listen to music, <laughs> okay? Um, and they rotate, okay? And so I can take my Bunsen burner and I can put it on my turntable, which I'm not using to listen to music anymore, right? And in fact, when John Arno comes up to talk about rotating uh, convection, I think on Thursday, I think he's going to bring a turntable and actually do some laboratory demonstrations during his lecture. But the point, I guess, is that for you know, a, a material like the mantle, where the viscosity is very high, there can be interesting and subtle effects of rotation that are involved true polar wander. But in a low viscosity fluid like the core, uh, the effects of rotation are, are profoundly important. And we're going to be learning a little bit about those things. This is an experiment from Peter Olson, who is unable to join us, unfortunately, that shows the sort of the structures that you get in a convecting fluid, much elongated, sort of these convective rolls that extend along the direction of the rotation vector. Very, very important in generating magnetic field and are completely the reason why the dipole axis tends, on average, to align with the rotation axis. Another consequence of rotation are these uh, zonal flows that you see on uh, Jupiter. In fact, the program that ended just as we were starting, the, almost the entire program, was dedicated to the idea of how these zonal flows emerge when the convective system is perturbed by small little perturbations, sort of a self-organized uh, structures. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics here. Uh, the geodynamo is a consequence of this. Uh, these helical sorts of flows are exactly the kind of flows that we need to produce magnetic fields. And when we get magnetic fields, those fields have another important influence on the dynamics. And so there's a lot. The dynamics is very rich. It gives rise to waves and other sorts of phenomena. And we're going to be sort of touching on a lot of those things over the course of, of the series. And then finally, I like this picture, turbulent convection. This is a picture of the sun. It's obtained by uh, Doppler measurements from the SOHO satellite. And so what you see in the bright regions are places where the sun is coming toward you, and then the dark regions are where it's receding. These are sort of thought to be convection cells. And then embedded in these little, or these things are sort of a much finer scale 
uh, grand, so-called granulation. So this is convection on the sun. You see bright regions, hot, where it's rising up and producing a little bit more light, a little bit darker where it's descending, little like mini subduction zones. And so this is a very, very different style of convection than the convection that we get in the mantle or the convection that we get in the Earth's core, but it's likely to be relevant for us in thinking about early states of the planet, say magma oceans and that sort of thing, which are the kinds of processes that set the initial condition for us. And so understanding or being able to sort of characterize these very, very challenging flows, again, is an important part of making progress. So to summarize, and I think I'm pretty much on time. Um, ultimately, I'd say geological activity is, is really all about convection. That's my bias. Um, I was going to make a challenge there, but I won't bother. I'm pretty sure that it's all about convection. I even think that uh, ocean and atmospheric science is all about convection, too. But, but, and I think that that's correct. Uh, the point is that there are a lot of things that we don't understand and, and really ripe areas for making progress. Understanding the complexities of the rheology, the influences of melting are things that we really haven't done a very thorough job yet, quite frankly. Core convection, we think we understand that process pretty well. The problem is that we just can't simulate in our computer codes uh, some of the uh, conditions that are expected. And I should have mentioned, actually, that one of the uh, tutorials will actually be using uh, a new Dynamo code to simulate that process and to build some insights. And then finally, the magma ocean convection is, again, something that's of interest to us because it really does set the initial condition. In some ways, the Earth problem is harder than the sun because we have the additional complexities of crystallization and then the mixing of those uh, crystals with time. But it's worth going after. It's worth pursuing because in some ways, after we set the initial condition, everything else is just all downhill from there. Okay. Um, maybe I'll turn it over to Bill and you can handle some questions. Are there questions before we get started? Gee. Well, it's probably, uh, well, okay, so I will repeat the question. Yeah, that, that's, a great, that's a great point, and let me sort of clarify here. So I would say, let's look at this picture right here. You know, we know we can calculate relatively reliably what ridge push is for this configuration, and it's clearly not enough to initiate subduction, right? That's true. And so we don't get the slab pull until we initiate the subduction zone. So something else has to happen, right? to basically produce that convergence that will allow us to start to tap the slab pull. So plate tectonics is the central paradigm of, of Earth science, really thinking about it from a dynamics. And we don't know how it starts, right? I would say slab pull, ridge push, these things are all understood, I would say. But the combination of processes that actually give rise to initiation of subduction is not. And so almost certainly it has to be convective fluctuations, stresses on the base due to flow. I don't know. But ridge push is not enough because otherwise these things would be going unstable all over the planet, and they're not. And that was Mackenzie's point. This is stable to small perturbations, but unstable to big ones. And it's the big ones and where they come from that we don't understand. Okay. Oh, Hero? Yeah, following up on that, uh, about the question about the sand. Yes. Yeah, why is that? No, I don't think so. I don't know why that is, but I suspect that that's just an artifact of the imaging. Mm. So, so, so for it's surprising that you don't see it because you think you'd see it more strongly there. But maybe it, it could well be what you're saying is that horizontal flows are larger and there's this projection effect. I don't know. But it is spectacular. And in fact, this and images like this, there's one just in the hallway, uh, which is just sort of striking in terms of the sort of the structure of convection. And you can imagine the challenge of trying to simulate that on a computer, the kind of resolution that you would need to do that job properly. But it's what we want to try to do. That's an observation. That's an observ this is, they're both observations. This is an optical. I think so, yeah, I think so. And it's probably what Hero was suggesting in the sense that the velocities are probably larger in the horizontal direction than they are in the vertical. And so what you're seeing is the, pro what you're seeing is the projection of the horizontal on the edges, my guess. 
but yeah, so it's pretty interesting for a Doppler image, right? It gives us hope that seismology is going to be able to really, you know, come to the grips. Doppler velocities, not, not temperature. Those are those are Doppler. These are basically temperature because that's an optical image, basically. That's like a photographic plate. So that's what you're really looking at is the, just the black body, right? And you're seeing the bright colors being the upwellings, hotter, brighter, and then the downwellings being the colder. And you know, again, these this is this is a spectacular. I mean, it's. I look at it, I think it's spectacular, I guess. Um, but the point is that the mantle of magma ocean would be doing, within limits, reasonable sorts of things. That's the problem that we want to try to tackle if we want to understand what happens during a magma ocean. Okay, good. Thanks, Bill.